Welcome to Shop Talk Live, brought to you by Tools Garage. I'm your host, Dave the Car Guy. Join us today as we dive into the world of car care and industry trends. Whether you're an enthusiast or just have a daily driver, we got you covered. Let's kick off today's episode. What's up, everybody? Dave the Car Guy. You know what time it is. That's right. Time for Shop Talk. I got today with me the master of minds, Mr. Camille Targosh. He is with Mechanic Grid, and he is uh, he's our marketing master. Welcome to the show, Camille. Thank you, Dave. Awesome. Glad to finally get you out here. You know, this is this is kind of cool because we've been working together for two, two years? Two and a half. Two and a half years. First time I've met Camille in person. Isn't that cool? Am I everything you expected? Absolutely. You are, too. You are, too. So, Camille, what, what the heck is Mechanic Grid? I mean, what is, it? What, is, what is that? We are a marketing agency that specializes in working with auto repair shops, specifically mechanical repair shops. Awesome. Um, what does that entail? And why, 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 be a, why be so specific to auto repair? What do, what do we need more than others? Apart from just liking cars, uh, you have to look at it from a perspective of how effective you can be working for a client. Uh, when we first started, we did everything. You know, you gotta eat. Yeah. So we yeah. did grocery stores, we did dentists, we did... I even had a Koi Pond company. Koi Pond? Yes. We actually had some conversation on Koi Pond a couple... Fascinating, and you learn Im- amazing things. But it takes a lot of time because you have to learn each business in you. Yeah. Every business is different. The nuances. Yes. Yeah. So when I stumbled on other repair shops and got a couple of clients and realized, hey, I like this. if I focus on this and I like cars, suddenly I can be a lot more effective yeah. because I'm not learning every time new things. Yeah. I can spend more time actually helping clients and less time figuring out to do yeah so um you're like a you're like a specialist you know and in the world of today having a specialty is is uh, a benefit uh it lets you really laser hone your craft uh what makes you a car guy uh what makes me a car guy is that i've been doing it for more than a decade and I've been working with shops ranging from literally a single owner and employee and mechanic and service writer shop to multi, multi-shop multi companies that have three, four, five, six shops. And surprisingly enough, there are certain stages in the life of a shop owner. And, uh, I'm and so, I know. <laughs> yeah, I think you would. There's some, some like pre-death feeling. Yeah, <laughs> some, of, some of that. So our goal is to not only to make the phones ring, but also to free up owners' time to be able to do all the other things that we need to do. Yeah, yeah. Marketing is not marketing is not everyone's sweet spot, you know. And especially in our our field, a lot of us have our converted mechanics, and uh, most of us. There's a reason we're mechanics. Really good at working on something, but when it it's, comes to involvement with other people, we get a little, you know, gruff or or other. And uh, marketing is a huge <laughs> contrast to how you're how you normally operate as a mechanic. Um, so why why does a mechanical shop need a a marketing person? Well, as a shop owner, you probably have three or four jobs to begin with, and marketing has become considerably more complex than it used to be. I mean, you know, 30 years ago, it was yellow pages, um, postcards, and then you get into expensive stuff like radio, TV, which most small businesses don't. Uh, and these people had specialists that would you know, design the ad for you or design a postcard for you, and mm-hmm. you, know, you send them money, they send it out, and you get some phone calls. Right now, in addition to all these things, you've got the web. So, you've got to build a website. That's sometimes fairly technical. 
especially if you want the website to rank well. You need a SEO specialist that will make the website rank well with search engines. You know, that's, that's a full-time job. Yeah. Then you've got pay-per-click advertising. That's Google, that's Yelp, that's Bing. Again, it requires pretty much a full-time person to stay on top of the changes because these things change regularly. So that's your third full-time job. And then there's the social media with all the fun and, and the, just the Wild West out there. The best part. Absolutely. <laughs> However, that's another full-time job. So yeah, you've just added sure. four full-time jobs to your already existing jobs. Right. Gluttons for punishment. Yes. Uh, eventually, you run out of time in the day. Yeah. And so that's sure. where we come in and help out with all these things. Uh, some of the work we do in house, some of it will be done through vendors, mm -hmm. and we kind of ride herd on on the whole thing and free your time up to do what you want to do. Perfect. Or what you have to do. Yes, what we have to do. Take off one of those hats. Uh, yeah. You look good in that hat, by the way. Uh, so, how big uh, how big a crew do you have, Camille? I've got seven contractors. Two in Europe, four in Asia, and one kind of keeps changing continents like every three months. <laughs> Mechanic Grid Global. Mechanic Grid Global. <laughs> That's awesome. So you are you work with like shops how I was when I first started, just me, to shops that have six and seven locations. What what is your What's your sweet spot? What do you feel like you... You have the most impact. Who do you have the most impact for? It's a difficult question to answer because on one hand, when I'm working with a shop where the owner, say, has one mechanic and that's it, it's a humongous impact in terms of owner's time. And we can grow the shop, we can double it, triple it. On the other hand, when you look at just sheer amount of money, clearly when I'm working with a six or seven shop, outfit the just 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 the amount of business that can be increased makes it a multi million dollar change yeah something that a single shop takes takes time yeah that's crazy um what is your best source for finding your clients word of mouth <laughs> word of mouth Word of mouth. So that means you must be good at your job or else people don't share that kind of information, especially their marketing secrets. <laughs> we don't share the secrets. Only with clients. Only with clients. Only with clients. So Camille, what, uh, what are some of the, the key ingredients in why you can have a full-time gig marketing with auto repair i mean why can't why can't we just not have any of that stuff well can you have a business that does not have marketing no it's, no but it's a lot difficult. you know do you, how much how much external marketing do you do i do relatively little simply because i get word of mouth yes. and each client, especially now that I'm getting more of the multi-shop clients, requires additional time on my part. Yes. And I need to train my people to make sure that they handle the new shops the right way. Uh, and even though some of them have been with me for you know, 10, even more years, there's still that aspect of this is a brand new shop or bunch of shops in a new state, for example. States do have differences in even though we say that you know customers are the same everywhere, there are local flavors. There are local, locally there are things that work better or worse. For example, there are towns where Google AdWords will just pay every day of the week, perfect. And then there are towns where you will see a sine wave. Two months it pays great, two months it's like a waste of money. And there is no way to tell. There's only, you could try it, and you see the results. So each new client with multiple shops in mul multiple towns requires that we do a form of discovery almost of that market before we can say, okay, now we know what to do and we can put up a little schedule. We have our monthly things to do and 
now it's flowing. But there is a period of about three to sometimes as long as six months where we're testing. doing research, we're yeah. testing, we're finding out what's working, how well it's working. Does it work all the time or just now and then? And only after it's all put together, we can create a, a schedule that can be kind of more predictive and Yep, you've uh, you've hit the nail on the head because we have three locations in three completely different s regions. We'll call it, you know, uh, our Bay Area Peninsula Bay Area location is kind of we we call that like major metropolitan feel. We have our Stockton in the middle of downtown in a pretty good sized city, and we have our Valley Springs location, which is in a town called Burson that has a population of four um not really 400 <laughs> maybe but it's it's a whole different world in each of them totally totally different world different cars different uh personalities different buying patterns so yeah you're i know that you've seen some of the stuff that we have to do at each of these stores um, which helps build your rapport, I think, you know, helping other shops too. Yes. Yeah. So you're into marketing, which means you're always looking at what's new, what's kind of cool in the world today. Uh, what do you do on your free time? Uh, free time? <laughs> you're an entrepreneur. You have a couple seconds of that. I do. Uh, I look at the neural networks, which is the AI, the chat GPT. Mm -hmm. uh, in my misspent youth, I wrote my master's thesis on neural networks. That was a long time ago when computers were too slow to really make a use of them. Now with the super fast computers, all the old algorithms from even 50 years ago are being used for chat GPT and, and all the AI revolution mm -hmm. that we're facing. And uh, what do you use AI for? I primarily use ChatGPT to do social media posts, to clean up press releases, to occasionally make a response to an online review better. I also use it to translate from foreign languages. It does a very good job, surprisingly mm. good job. <clears throat> I haven't used it for that yet. That's probably a good idea. I think we're used to using the whole Google Translate uh, on my phone. Oh, there's no comparison. No comparison. Sweet. Um, I I did notice that you you had some information about your your doctorate. Was it that you? No, did no on, it was my master's. Thesis. Master's master's thesis um, on on AI, and uh, you you mentioned using it to to uh, almost cross-check somebody else's AI that they're using to see if it's any good. How does that work? Uh, that process is fairly convoluted. <laughs> <clears throat> the reason I ask, Camille, because, you know, when, you know, as we've discussed lots of times, my, my visionary brain is always like, oh, you know, penny, shiny penny. Um, I'm always looking at new new things. I decipher it out in my head a little bit, and then I throw some things your way, and you're like, okay, give me a day. And you come back with all this data that you know beats the crap out of it, or like, hey, this is pretty good. I'm, I'm presuming you're using a little bit of your, your AI for, for that. A little bit. Yeah. Actually, a lot of it comes from other companies that provide information for the auto industry. And we are really lucky in the auto repair industry to have companies that provide us with all kinds of data. You know, Kukui, Auto Vitals, yeah. Auto Shop Solutions. They gather a lot of data out of the shop management systems and process the, that in a more useful fashion that's easier to extract and make sense of. <clears throat> We will be doing a lot more AI in the future, but that's that's probably six to twelve months down the road. And uh, I've just hired two more assistants so that I can 
shift more towards the AI mode because that's going to be time consuming. That's going to be my nights. <laughs> what um, continent are they on? The idea is to be able to go into the shop management systems and use that data to do some predictive modeling. And that's all I'm going to say for now because this is still totally nebulous and in the early stages. Right on. I like it. So this, uh, this summer coming up, got any plans? Work. Aside from work, Camille, we, I know you work. I, you work. You give me a call when I'm driving home from work. Sometimes I'm at home. I'm, of course, doing some work. You're calling me up at late, those later hours. I, I know you work. What, uh, got to have something coming up this summer. Uh, we are planning a, tr a trip to the desert. Desert. S seems everybody in the family loves those big open spaces. You know, the road with no one on it. The road with no one on it. And what do you, what do you guys uh, enjoy out there? Is it camping? Is it just... Just, you know, just being out there where there's a lot of open space. Cool. Um, we'll probably go to see the dinosaur sites in Nevada. Uh, there, Very cool. There's some, may even make it as far as Utah. That'll be awesome. Yeah. Go check out the Hoodoos. Yes. Bryce Canyon. Mm -hmm. Bryce, Bryce Canyon. Um, a lot of cool stuff. I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff in this country that uh, uh, I haven't seen. You know, I I know at some point I would like to take a a trip to Europe, check out places like Italy. But I mean, the reality is that. There's so much stuff still here that I haven't seen yet uh, because of that. I mean, it's because of that time thing, not yeah. having any. Huh. That thing, we'll, yes. We'll figure, <laughs> we'll figure it out. I think you're helping me with that, to, to be fair. Um, so, you know, you're, you got a, you got a lot of shop owners that I know that, that use Mechanic Grid. Um, all of them are very successful shops. What what do you look for when you're trying to onboard or, you know, you get a referral for a for a shop? Do you you just take them all or are you looking for something specific? Obviously, I will talk to any referral, as if nothing more, as a courtesy to the person who referred me. Uh, in general, I would like to see that there is a certain amount of chemistry between me and the shop owner mm -hmm. it's chemistry it's it's difficult to, to describe to define but sometimes you just talk to someone and it's like you know what that's probably not gonna work long yeah. term. we're gonna we're gonna go to battle yeah <laughs> and i understand that clients can have different approaches to things but sometimes you just yeah you, know, you talk for five minutes and you know it's not gonna work yeah yeah and you just gotta let it let it go yeah, I think every industry needs to think like that. You know, we we try and do the same thing in our world. You know, we, we like to think that the way we do stuff is for everyone, but it, it truly isn't. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's there are some people that just don't, they don't, and it's our fault, we're not explaining some things right, but they just don't want to see the big picture on their car you know it's our job to make sure that they do so and it helps us to keep that uh that holistic view of the vehicle and so we if we get a, a random phone call a couple months down the road like hey i got this weird weird sound coming from the left when i'm turning we can kind of look in the history and go yeah that, oh that's probably this thing that we we noticed um that doesn't didn't need attention but you know it's probably getting to be that point now so that's this and it's not it's not a scary thing just leave it alone uh some people just don't like that they don't want to know that stuff and it's it's a weird balance between how you are not supposed to share those things to to share it um and i feel like we got to pick that up in our clients earlier so we can be on the same page and have a better working relationship if that makes sense kind of ties into you know knowing that 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 yes and and sometimes it's easier sometimes it's obvious that given customer is just not going to do these things they, yeah. they have a very specific mindset i just want an oil change and i don't want to know anything about anything yep and that's okay 
yeah nothing and, wrong with it and sometimes it's just an attitude of the person because that's how they treat the car you know they drive it till it drops and buy another one sometimes it's a matter of money because they are in a spot in their life where they just cannot afford to do a two thousand dollar maintenance yeah and yeah you know, we've all been there yeah absolutely absolutely i feel like you know in 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 our world it's it's always a it's a catch-22 i gotta share it i wouldn't feel right if we didn't and you know when we share it sometimes it's goes the wrong way uh, but a lot of our clients are you know they're like me i don't i don't want anything going on with my car you know i got a couple hundred thousand miles on my vehicle it is it runs like it did when it was brand new it drives like it did when it's brand new it sounds like it did I mean, if it's if it's starting to leak or starting to seep, whatever, I'm like, change it, change it. Because if I don't, I end up with three or four of them <laughs> that I got to get done. And there's my $4,000 bill that I could have avoided had I done a couple hundred here and a couple hundred there. Um, so the you started out in this in this industry of marketing. Why? You know, you were it sounds like you were into uh, computing, uh, you know, at your yes. collegiate level. So what's, what, I, what got I you I spent over there? 20 years in Silicon Valley doing quality control for software camp companies that ranged from, you know, four guys to, you know, 4,000. So literally from startups to multi-billion dollar companies. And after about 20 years, it became obvious that it was time for a change. Part of, part of it was Silicon Valley changing and pushing more of the quality work onto customers instead of doing it in-house. Uh, part of it was management change where Silicon Valley adopted something called, you know, I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> it's difficult to remember it, but to just, just, just the gist of it is that you were supposed to have daily meetings with your team. And they were supposedly, they were supposed to last 15 minutes. This was adopted from the manufacturing industry where you do have your five to 10 minute meeting at the beginning of a, of a day. Yeah. You tell everybody, you know, this is what we're gonna be doing. Uh, here are the issues with machine X, everything else is running. Uh, you know, maintenance is gonna come in and take care of it. And after five minutes, everybody goes to their machines. In the meantime, a supervisor warms up the machines, calibrates them, so they can be productive right away. In Silicon Valley, you have a 15-minute meeting where you have you know, 10, 15 people in a room. First of all, it's really tough to keep it down to 15 minutes. And you don't really resolve anything. So you have 14 people sitting, listening to one guy talking, most of their time is wasted because they usually work on different projects. So, you know, if I'm working on project A, I don't care what's happening on project B. They are unrelated. And as I say, the, the meetings lasted a lot longer than the allocated 15 minutes. And human beings take a lot longer time than machines to become productive. If they come into a meeting, it takes them 15 minutes to prepare for the meeting, 15 minute meeting, they go out, it takes them another 20 to 30 minutes to be fully productive. Mm -hmm. With 15 people in a room, I just lost, lost 15 man hours. That's like having two guys sick permanently. Yep. That got old. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing when you, when you really, when you start to manage time and, uh, and see where it goes. We operate a lot on our productivity time. And in our world, we have... You know, back in the day, we used to be like, and and this is how I started. I'm the mechanic. I answer the phone. I'm the one telling you what's wrong, how much it is. Uh, I did not produce a lot of man hours. Like, I didn't help as many cars as I could have because of all the other stuff that I'm doing. Well, as we've evolved, now we have our our front counter service advisors liaison between our clients and our technicians are just working on fixing cars, 
you know, testing and analyzing systems and problems. And what we do here at our shops is really try and make sure the technician has everything they need so they can start a job and finish it. And we really preach to our advisors, don't interrupt them. Do not interrupt the technicians because what happens is you as a technician, if you come over and I'm in, I'm on, I'm on a mode and I stop and engage and we're, you know, they're answering viable questions to start back again. I am not at that same pace. It's you literally lose 20 minutes, 20 minutes of time in that, 30 seconds, 45 seconds of conversation. Um, you you can add that up. You can watch it. You can see how much time you lose just by doing that. So what you're saying is with those minutes, it's it's the process. If you break that process, it takes, it's like stopping a, a train. It takes a little bit to get back up to 60 miles an hour again. So totally, totally uh, agreeable with what you're what you're talking about in in our industry as well and another benefit of what you're doing is that you can focus on technicians being specialists in working on cars they don't need to be people who can handle talking to customers yes they can be good at one thing they can be very good at it Hmm. equally you can find people for the front desk who are very good at talking with people who don't necessarily need to know how to you know take out a catalytic converter yep or even what a math sensor is yes you know so that they can focus on their specialty yes absolutely absolutely yeah it's uh it's amazing how those little micro moments have a a larger impact so you know when we when we look at at the at the whole day holistically if we can have that communication between our clients and and it works the best when when they're on top of it like when we reach out and they they we tell them what we found what we see what we might recommend what they want to have done if they get us that information quickly enough we can keep the technician working which basically allows us to get help one one extra person per technician per day potentially by not interrupting them it's it's really insane how how much difference it makes that's incredible i mean that's 250 cars per per year yes easily easily so um the the marketing aspect of it <clears throat> you know you're you're not you, i know you do some social media stuff but you're not a you're not a big advocate of of social media I have my, I, I, I like using, I like being on social media cause I like to share stuff. I like to share stuff. Um, the value that it brings, um, my goal is to, to see by having conversations out there and to all the billions and billions of people watching this right now, how much of that translates to clients coming into our shop. Uh, how do you think you're able to track that, if any, if if at all? Well, the social media has its place, obviously, and those billions of people. Uh, Watching I'm sure you they, right now. They enjoy <laughs> your show. I am judged by the amount of revenue that the shops produce. Mm-hmm. If the shops grow, it's great. If they don't, uh, you know, sooner or later, I'll be looking for another client. Um, so... Our focus is on the areas that we know will produce revenue for the shop. And then once we've covered all of that, that's when the social media comes in in full force because we can do shows like this. We can provide ads on the social media. We can do posts. We can tell people, you know, what's happening in the shop. Interesting tidbits or at least stuff that we think is interesting. Um, can we track the revenue from that? That's been very difficult. That's why social media is kind of down on my list of yes. of channels through which we gather customers. 
Uh, some companies will offer tracking numbers that can be integrated. Their systems can be integrated with the shop management systems. And so they can pull data out of the shop management system and based on the time of the phone call, who called, they can compare it to what happened uh, in the shop management system where there was a repair order or not. And so they can attribute revenue to a specific phone call. And because we have multiple tracking numbers for SEO, for pay-per-click, we can actually see how much money we're getting. You know, we spend $2,000 a month on Google AdWords. How much did that produce? Uh, that information is crucial. Not many companies offer that. Most companies don't, but there are some companies like Kukui, yep. which do a great job of that. Uh, and so, yeah, Kukui shops, as I call them, are my preferred shops because they make my life a lot more effective being able to track being able to track being able to see what works what doesn't work in a given city it's back to that research that we do you know what works in that particular city it's not immediately obvious that postcards are going to work you have to run it for a few months and see the results so being able to track the results is is crucial and we're kind of spoiled in this industry because not everybody has that. Most industries don't have that level of tracking. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, speaking of, of like postcards and things like that, I, I think that a lot of people don't, don't really know what all that stuff costs, what a business, what a small business has to spend in marketing dollars to help you know, grow their business. I mean, what do, what do you see in, 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 you've worked in many different industries. Who, uh, who, who has to, who has to spend the most just to get clients? Do you think? I don't know who has to spend most. I know who spends most from you know, smaller businesses and that's the heating air conditioning people they spend a lot of money compared to your shops no comparison literally um, why is that you think I suppose the the jobs are pretty big and so there is revenue there sufficient to justify the the spend of advertising and also you know you need something done with a car you're gonna call a friend hey you know who do you use in, in town? How often do you call a friend asking, hey, who is your heating air conditioning specialist? <laughs> so I, I think that's one of the reasons. Um, more general answer is, you know, what does a small business spend on marketing? I talked to a couple accountants who are friends and, and they work with small businesses. And about 7% of yearly revenue is, is the right number. Now, there are some gurus in the auto industry that say you should spend 5% of your goal. So if you, if you want to do, I don't know, $2 million next year, you should spend 5% of that or $100,000 during the year to hit that $2 million goal. And it's a reasonable rule of the thumb yeah i think we i think we are pretty much near that on a on a yearly basis and as we grow it's it's incredible to see how much of that how much that is you know mm -hmm. it's it adds up it definitely adds up you know we talk about you know where it all goes and how very little of it can hit the hit the end um but a lot of that, you know, 5%, 7% sounds like not a lot, but it's, it's a good chunk. It's a, it's significant. Yes. Um, <clears throat> what's your favorite platform? What, what do you, what's your kind of like your go-to? What are you looking for when you're, when you're trying to set somebody up to succeed with mechanic grid? The web platform 
is the foundation. Your website is going to be an absolute foundation on which you build everything else. You build pay-per-click on it, you build your postcards, you build your social media. They all point to, to your web. So you need a good web company that will pr produce websites that have a potential to rank well. And in our industry, that's Kukui, uh, could be Auto Vitals, could be Auto Shop Solutions. They are the top three right now, and they produce good websites. My preference is Kukui because of the revenue attribution. Uh, there is a solid, it works really well, and it can be used to make decisions that make a difference. Once you have the website, then it's a matter of adding content to it, and that's where our special sauce comes in. Uh, we know how to write content that ranks well with search engines. Yes, you do. Thank you. Yes, you do. Um, <clears throat> so I noticed when we first started working together, you definitely did some, uh, some of the content on our pages. Uh, you definitely believe in, in getting blogs uh, written and posted periodically and probably more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, consistently than I do. Um, I used to enjoy, when I, when I was a single shop, it was kind of fun. I like writing stuff. I don't know. I don't know why. I never cared much for it in school. Um, but now, like, when I'm just brainstorming, stuff just starts coming out on paper. And it was fun writing them when I had time, I guess, in, as a single shop. With the multiples and, you know, pulling out, you know, adding those hats, it really, it went away. And, you know, when we had you jump on board, I noticed the, the blogs were coming in and I was like, oh, eh, this guy's all right. He can write, he can write as, as well as I do um, or better. Now I know it's AI, so, you know, I'm, no, it's, it's not. Actually, it is not AI. Not. They are all no. human written. Yes. And, and there is a reason for that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can, I can see a lot of people are very much into the AI and, um, I can only imagine like how many different variations can AI spit out. So if you're, if you say, Hey, I want an article on this, it's going to spit it out. And somebody across the you know, city says, Hey, I want an article on this. And it spits out the same thing. That's, it's not going to look good. It's going to look like copy. Uh, well, there, there is a whole new, I don't want to sell call it, I guess, a job or, or a whole new profession, which is writing prompts for the AI. How do, you, how do you ask the AI to do stuff for you? And depending on how you phrase the question, you'll, you'll get very different results. Right. So theoretically, two people across the town could get totally different um, blog post written. Hmm. However, uh, Google does request that if your AI generates a blog post, that you tell it that it's AI generated. Huh. And there are ways of telling whether it's written by a human or by AI. Really? It's freaky, it's, it's complex, it's something that you know, real computer geeks who have nothing better to do play with. Mm. But there are tools that are used to find out if something was written by an AI or if it was written by a human. And of course, there's a whole industry of learning how to trick those tools to believe that it's human written, even though it's mostly AI. It's, it's just crazy. From yeah. our perspective, it's simpler and better to stick to what Google requests, which is if it's written by a human, it's a human. Yeah. If it's written by an AI, you tell in, in the blog somewhere in the post, you say this, this was generated by an AI. And of course, the reason for that is that Google wants quality, but it also wants to be able to tell. And there is always the fear in the marketing industry that if the Google decides they don't like you because you've transgressed one of the rules, uh, your web pages or even the entire website might be dropped down in ranking. That or, would never happen. Uh, it actually happens to people who yes, consistently <laughs> yes, uh, abuse those rules. And while from my perspective, I'd like Google to be much more vigilant, I have seen companies that transgressed and paid the price. So we stick to the 
chapter and verse, whatever Google wants. And to Google's credit, it's been incredibly consistent. That's one thing that they've been consistent about from day one. What they want in terms of the content and the rules for that are very clear. You know, you, you can't transgress accidentally. It's, it's just clear. Well, that's why I am thankful to have you on my team because as an entrepreneur and a uh, person who doesn't like people telling them what to do, it's tough to not try and figure out how to bend or break some some rules. And that's an arena that we probably shouldn't be. So um, thank you for keeping us on the straight and narrow. Um, so, you know, Google the whole Google machine, you know, it's changed a lot. Um, years ago when we were a single shop, we, we did a lot of the Google, I forgot what it was called. Was it Google my business or something like that? The, their platform, we were doing a lot of little video clips and, and vlogs and posts and pictures. And, and there was a period of time where uh, we, I don't know. It's almost like we broke Google. We were doing so much hybrid stuff that like if you looked us up anywhere in the area, like you typed in hybrid, it only, it only pulled us up. It was the craziest thing. People were coming. How are you doing that? Like, I have no idea. I think they caught on and, you know, fixed it, but something happened. <laughs> something happened. How does that, how does that occur? Sometimes you just stumble on the magic sauce. Did I break, did I the, break the rule? <laughs> I mean, think about it. There, there are so many parameters in Google's algorithm. I mean, there are literally hundreds, and they are not one or zero. They have, they, they have a range. So realistically, the only way to know what's going to happen is to do something and run it for the Google system. I don't believe in, that even Google employees can guess what the effect is going to be. They just have to run it for the whole thing and see what comes out. Um, so uh, occasionally you stumble on, on, on the magic combination. Uh, when it comes to hybrid, there were a lot fewer hybrid shops then. Yep. There were shops that worked Did on hybrid. Oil change too. I was popping up in the... Uh, That's fantastic. Without, <laughs> without spending any ad money. On. I hope you t kept diary and we do it again. Yeah, I, I tried again. It didn't work the same. So I don't know what happened. They must have, they must have said, hey, this... This goofball is doing something weird. We don't like it. Let's fix it. It could have been also an adjustment of one of the parameters or a <clears> bunch <throat> of them as part of the Google's uh, algorithm changes, which they do fairly regularly. And some of them can be fairly benign, not that many things. And sometimes they'll roll out something that will just knock down entire websites 90%. I mean, literally, you could see a website that lost 90% of the traffic. Aye. And it's not that they were doing something wrong. It's just that the Google's algorithm changed and the website did not match what Google was now looking for. Now, I notice when you're, when you're doing a lot of um, searching today, the need to go to their actual web, to your actual website is becoming slimmer and slimmer. You're getting almost all your data in their, in their little Google, Google box, the reviews, the pictures, the, all that stuff. Is it, are they trying to eliminate the need for websites and pretty much be the, the grandmaster? Well, if you're a Google, wouldn't you want all the traffic to just flow to you and nowhere else? And stay. Yes. Yes. So yes, they're trying to do that. However, I don't see them succeeding. Okay. There's still going to be a place for websites. They'll still have to show in the search results the links to the websites because people expect that. For a lot of both services and products, you know, a little blurb is not going to be enough. Yeah. You do need to give the consumer more information. And Google has been consistent in tracking that. You know, are people staying on on the web page? Are they just looking at it and leaving, or do they stay thirty or forty seconds, or two minutes, or five minutes? And they reward. That's part of the algorithm is to reward the pages with higher ranking, pages where people spend more time reading them. So those little blurbs 
I don't think they're going to do it. No. All right. Well, that's cool. Um, so your, your growth for Mechanic Grid, what is your, what's your anticipation for 2024? Are you trying to take on how many more, how many more new clients this year? Uh, that will depend on a big decision that I need to make. Do, do we stay a boutique shop where we provide high touch service? As you said, you know, I, I call it odd times of day or night. And you can call me at odd times of day or night, and I'll pick up my phone. I know you do. <laughs> um, or do we scale? And that's that's a difficult thing to do, to scale and maintain the quality. Absolutely. You know, there, are, there are companies Still that are... Still trying. <laughs> there are companies in our space that are much bigger. Uh, they do a good job but you don't get the same personal quality, the same personal touch, the same service. Yeah. And I'm still struggling with how to maintain that while while growing. So at, at this point, I'm considering different avenues and I have no answer at this point. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's it growth is and the expansion is not for everyone. It's it's not for the squeamish for sure. <laughs> Uh, or control freaks, right? Um, it's it is difficult to try and maintain that that level of personal touch. Um, you know, we've with the growth that you've, you know, you came on board when we first uh, we were was it before? Yeah, it was right before we got into the Stockton location, correct? Sure, that was right after you opened Valley Springs and Stockton was still being negotiated. There we go. So, um, having the right people in place, the right systems and processes is a must, right? You, I'm sure you, you're pretty detailed. I'm sure you have your SOPs probably fairly lined up. Having the right people to to feel that and have the energy to want to do the same thing that you do is next to impossible, but they're out there. And, you know, we just, I just had a conversation with night heating, air conditioning and solar um, about expansion. And he's like, yeah, man, we could really use some more people. And I'm like, well, how, how's the interview process going? Well, it's not, you know, we're not, <laughs> we're not doing anything. It's amazing how, much we don't um since the expansion for me uh, and our team i've interviewed so many people you know it's sometimes we don't even have any room for people but we'll interview because if you've come across that person you know you if you interview camille and you're interviewing you're like wow this this person is just like me uh i gotta put i gotta find a spot for him Right, you gotta yes. you gotta bring him in, but that might have been like your sixth person that year that you interviewed. Well, if you're not interviewing, you won't come across Camille Junior. So, do you have some sort of a employee or plan or something? I'm looking at resumes, probably not every day, but every week. Uh, all of my contractors are under orders. If they see anybody who displays initiative, who's got a spark in their eye, I want to talk to that person. You know, I, I may not have a budget this moment, but I'll figure out a way to make budget to bring them on board, even on part-time basis, just, just so they will hang out with me instead of going to work for somebody else. Absolutely. And that's an ongoing process, and you know it's, it's like finding diamonds. You have to move a lot of earth, a lot of dirt, but eventually you will find the diamond, and that diamond makes a difference. Absolutely, and 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 finding a diamond is intentional. The, you're not you're not just walking around throughout the day and go, oh, diamond. <laughs> no, it doesn't work like that. So the the we've had some fantastic additions to our company 
literally over the last two months. Um, we are we have been interviewing with intention, and we've we've found some people that are they're immediate difference makers, and and you really it's kind of it's kind of awe inspiring when you when you just plug the the right character the right person in place how much of a difference it makes it's incredible even like, like i described before the the training the amount that you really need to give them is a fraction a fraction when they are the right fit um so, you know, constantly looking, constantly talking, and constantly getting better at the questions that you need to ask. That's true, because yes. you do get better you get asking questions much better. and interviewing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Seeing body language. Sometimes you ask those questions, not for the answer, just to see what happens. Like, so, something, something you get. Um, there, that's, that's all you needed, right? That's right. <clears throat> like any process, you get better at it the more you do it. Yeah. And so it becomes less expensive in terms of your time. Because you you have now you now have sources where you know that you can get good resumes from. And your interviewing process gets shorter. Absolutely. Um, there is a book written about checklists. I think it's called the checklist. And there, make sense. there is there's a story there about a financial guy hedge fund that decided to implement checklists uh, for selecting uh, new investments. And the guy says that, you know, I thought it would actually slow us down because we had a really long checklist. But then during the 2008 uh, financial problems, we found that we were actually able to go through a lot more potential candidates. And so we made a lot more investments. And his explanation was that the first part of the checklist was stuff that would just eliminate potential investment. So they would go through list one, two, three, four. Oh, it, they don't have the right ratio of something. They're out. Instead of spending another two or three weeks with a whole team analyzing this, no, they're out. Next. And so they were able to look for a lot more investments and make a lot more investments. And apparently, you know, they didn't give numbers, but they had a stellar year. Um, the same for us. If if we can catch a candidate early that's got promise, but there's that one fatal flaw, got to let it go. Yep. They need absolutely. to go somewhere else where their unique talents will be used and appreciated, yep. but not yep. for us. Yeah. You have to be willing to let that go because yeah. it's without question... It doesn't work, right? Yeah. You will fight. They will fight. They don't, no one will be happy. And if you're operating in win-win-win scenarios, nobody does. So yeah. People talk about culture, and it's a nebulous term, culture. What is the culture? But there, there is something uh, that, you know, you've just got a gut feeling sometimes. And, you know, if it says no, trust it. Yes. Let it go. Yes. Yeah. Culture is huge. You know, I... This is before you and I started working together, but I had a couple of presentations that I did at uh, this convention called Ratchet and Wrench, um, and we did we did our first I did my first one on on shop culture because it's always in, in intrigued me because as, as a young mechanic I went to a dealership and you know I wasn't always you know bubble gum and rainbows. Um, I was, you know, I had a chip on my shoulder, you know, I, you know, a scrapper and, you know, my, you know, I knew everything cause I was, you know, younger than I am now. Um, uh, and in the shop I was at this dealership, I was the youngest guy by at least 15 years. And, you know, I, I ended up working myself into a, a foreman position, but I had noticed that. I like to have fun, you know, I listen to music and, you know, whatever. Sometimes I would sing a little whatever off-key song while I'm working and I'll play jokes with people and the shop kind of started becoming that. And it was, 
it was cool but it wasn't as professional as it should have been and you know at 20 something years old I didn't care until I did and then I realized you know as especially as I started to get towards that foreman role I'm like you know I feel like I caused this so let me see if I can change it a little bit and I worked on you know the professionalism the training getting the guys the right tools and acting differently and sh the whole shop changed not immediately but you know it it changed and i've been there for eight years so i saw the progression of mm -hmm. what it changed too and i'm like i i did this i'm not even the owner of this place or the manager so culture can be changed with one person so imagine if that person is your is not a good not a good source of culture they're going they can easily change the dynamic of your whole business. Yes, especially that it's easier to damage than to build. Yes. <clears throat> you're you're changing the culture probably took months of hard work. Uh you know somebody can come in and and destroy your shop in a span of a month. Yes. Just just poison the atmosphere totally. And, you know, the results will show up in everything. We've, we've actually had that occur in, in one of our locations with two, two different employees. And it takes time to repair it. So, yes. you know, making the right hire and picking up those things uh, ahead of time is so key. Like you have no idea when we say it's super important. It is beyond super important to see that stuff right away. Um, so how many how many employees do you like? If you if you're like you know what I'm going for it. I want to I want to I want to have I want to have a boutique level business. But grow. How many how many key people do you need to allow you to maybe still offer that boutique touch? Key people or people in general? Um key. Key people. Uh I'm at this point I'm looking at about twelve key people. That's assuming considerable growth. But finding them, <laughs> we're back to yes, looking. Absolutely. It is, it is difficult. They're out there. They're out there. They're out there. Uh, part of the problem is that, you know, if they are like me, chances are after two or three years, they'll go out on their own. And so, you know, <clears throat> one, one of my strategy will be to invest in them. Absolutely. If I'm going to lose them, I want at least to have something from that. <laughs> absolutely. You know, there's always that fear of, uh, of people leaving and you know we've we've had a we've had we've had one one of our mechanics he he left to start his own so you know we we were happy for him um it's it always is that fear that you're training you're training them so well that that's what's going to happen you just can't and it will you happen. can't worry about it yeah mm -hmm. you just have to you have to do what you do. Like I tell my team, my job is to make sure you are so happy that you tell every person that tries to poach you to F off. That's, that's my job. Um, so far I'm, I'm doing a pretty good job because, uh, you know, I've had, I've had several of my people go, Oh yeah, this place called me. I told them, bro, you know where I work. <laughs> try, try someone else. So, um, I think that's, I think that's, that's cool. So everybody out there, the billions and billions share and share to the other billions and billions. Camille needs 12, 12 key people to help him grow. And what kind of key people are you looking for? What kind of character traits, what kind of culture are you looking for? Those are people who want to do better every day, a little bit better, but consistently. It's, it's that consistent improvement over time that just makes up just insane difference. 
and what kind of what kind of technical skill set are you looking for? What kind of person? What what are what have they been doing up to that point, up to this point, right before they jump on board with you? Some marketing background would be good, but there is no like specific requirement. You know, seven and a half years of X. Yeah. Uh, in marketing, we tend to wear different hats. So, and a hat will do as long as you've had experience with marketing. It helps if you can write good English. <laughs> it helps if you can do copywriting, but it's not a necessity because that's trainable. It's, again, it's the trainable skills versus the attitude. I want to do better every day, just a little bit better. That's all. 1% better every day. You will be surprised at how good you are at the end of the year. Um, so college level, uh, you know, marketing as a, as a major. Not necessary. No, just any, any level. Old guy like me. Uh, you said you like writing and you're good at it. Yeah. Uh, anytime you have time, talk to I me. Have, I have a hat. I need writers. I have a hat that I've given up, so <laughs> maybe I'll put the marketing one back on. Um, so, yeah, there I've, I'll tell you, we a friend of mine owns a, a brewery in San Carlos, Devil's Canyon Brewery. Shout out. They're awesome there. They had hired a marketing uh, person, and she was... A, I think just out of college. She's still with them. It's been, uh, I don't know how many years, m several uh, years. And she is awesome. She's awesome. She does an amazing job for that company. And it's, it's, it's great to see like the young kids, like, like these guys here, you know, they're, they're just driven. There's, there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of youngsters out there that are that are still driven. You know, we're we're used to thinking of the ones that are not. Don't um, get me started, because <laughs> it seems like that's the, that's the norm. But you know, I think I think that uh, there's there's more than we think out there that are that are driven. They're go getters. They want to improve. You know, one percent every day, and um, you just got to find them. Yeah, yeah and and I think a lot of us, especially those of us who've gone through school and you know got their degrees, uh, we think in terms of okay, do you have a diploma? Do you have a certificate? Do you have this or that? Uh, credentials are becoming less and less important in a lot of disciplines. Finally, yes. Finally, my theory and thesis has come true. Uh, I have a friend who can walk into a building like this, bare walls, and within a week, you can run a worldwide computer company from there. He'll put in the phones, he'll put in the ne networks, he'll put in the computers, he'll put in the whole thing, entire network operating center. He will build out the cubicles. He can do that. He has a high school diploma, that's it. You're looking at just a high school diploma guy here and, you know, not that I'm going to build out a worldwide network, but, uh, you know, I think, I think we're doing okay. So, so see, you don't have to go, go if you want, but you don't have to go. <laughs> um, so Camille, you know, how, uh, how can people find you? What, are, what how do they, how do they get a hold of you aside reaching out to me and I'm going to refer them to you anyway. Um, just find mechanicgrid.com. Mechanicgrid.com. Now, where'd that name come from? <clears throat> mechanic Grid. Well, mechanic because we're dealing with mechanical that's, repair that's shops. Obvious. Uh, the grid part is, you know, when you plug into the grid, the lights come on. <laughs> it now makes sense. It now makes sense. Should have asked him that like two and a half years ago. So anybody looking who has an auto repair shop and and wants to get rid of one of those hats, because I know you got it. Um, Camille is the man. Uh, he's been he's been helping me out for the last two and a half years. It's been great. Uh, mostly just throwing out 
my visionary jargon to him and him having him volley it back with mostly no's. Um, but at least it saves me a lot of time. Uh, and <clears throat> if you're, if you're in need of that, definitely reach out mechanic grid.com. My guy Camille. Um, and a big shout out to, to a friend of mine, Bill Adams, who's the one who referred me like you were talking mostly referrals. Uh, Bill Adams, who's a shop owner in the East Bay area. So thank you, Bill. And uh, one of these days, I'm going to get Bill on the show, and we're going to see if we can light light him up. Oh, that would be fantastic. Oh, my God. He, we're probably going to have to keep keep track of the time. when Just, just start on Friday. We'll, you'll be done by Monday. <laughs> yeah. Between him and I, we'll probably just, uh, you know, need you need catered food for a week. Mm. Um well, Camille, um, any last words of wisdom that uh, you care to share? Wisdom about marketing? Wisdom about anything Camille has. Just keep doing it. Even if your marketing sucks or you think that it sucks, do it consistently. It makes a difference. Again, it's that 1% every day. Because as you keep doing it, you'll find ways to make it a little bit better and over time, it adds up a lot. And Dave, thank you for having me on. Uh, I must say that you make my work a lot easier. Well, thank You're, you. You have excellent people, and they do a really good job. And so, you know, I make the phones ring. They take care of the rest. And that's, that's rare. And you let me know when they're not. That's, that's awesome, because then I get to come in and say, look... I didn't see this. Camille saw this, so <laughs> let's fix that. Um, so yes, yes, thank, you can always blame it. Thank on you, me. scapegoat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Camille, it's been awesome. I'm so glad we got a chance to meet in person. I've seen you on a Zoom call and a and phone only. So um, you know, I, I, our friend Bill Adams, he's he's got his his name for you. His uh, you are uh, Camille, the Evil Emperor. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, for me, and, and when I'm having my conversations, I got uh, uh, Camille Targaryen. Uh, we, we, you, you had no idea, but you got all kinds of cool names that we throw out at you. So <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so let's get back to work. Uh, Camille's been awesome. And I'm Dave the Car Guy, signing out. Thanks for listening to Shop Talk Live. For more episodes, follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram at Tools Garage. Remember, drive safe and stay tuned for more. Until next time, I'm Dave the Car Guy, signing out.